forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Abib. Last month we were talking about the Holy Spirit, the theme of the Holy Spirit. This month we speak about the Apostles. We have the Apostles' Feast this Wednesday, because we were fasting this whole time, and we get to feast on Wednesday. Um, we have an adjustment on the liturgy that day, but <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. Um, and we see how our Lord supports his apostles <clears throat> and gives them authority and commissions them to serve the world. Now, let's, let's go for a tangent a little bit. This week, we celebrated one of my favorite holidays. We celebrated the Feast of Independence Day on our civil calendar. But in the life of the church, <clears throat> we are consistently asked to think differently about the meaning of things especially things that we might otherwise take for granted. <clears throat> so the world gives us one definition of a thing, but the church gives us a completely different, another meaning. Today, the terms that require us to think differently according to the wisdom of God are the words independence and freedom. We have many freedoms in this land. We have the freedom to pray in public and to worship in places that we choose. We have the freedom to vote. We have the freedom to work and to purchase whatever we like, provided that we pay our taxes. We have the freedom to speak our minds. And, and uh, <clears throat> many of these freedoms are granted to us by the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But ultimately, these old documents, you know, give us some rights, but these freedoms are, are birthright from God. And what I mean by this is that God has created us and given us the freedom to be and to do whatever it is that we choose to do. It was the case in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. God gave Adam and Eve freedom to thrive or freedom to fail. One of the teachings of St. Paul that always resonates with me is that all things are lawful, but not all things edify. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. What does that mean for us as Christians? It means that we may have the freedom to do whatever we want, but it doesn't mean that exercising that freedom will build us up. Exercising that freedom may not make us saints or holy people that is well-pleasing to God. We strive for our freedoms and, and truth. And so sometimes we might become bitter and angry and resentful when others try to take away our freedoms. So we know why we celebrate Independence Day as Christians. But the question that I have this time of the year is what is true independence according to Christ and his church? Independence according to the world is to be free, to exercise our free will and fulfillment of our own desire. <clears throat> so we celebrate our independence and our ability to pursue happiness. We celebrate the ability to follow our desires and our inclinations and to do whatever gives us pleasure. Independence is our ability to govern our own lives and to choose how we will live. <clears throat> Every teenager knows this desire. They look forward to the days when they can do whatever they want. In fact, the Christian understanding of independence has nothing to do with chasing our desires or governing our own will. Because our true freedom as Christians isn't understood as freedom to do certain things. Our true freedom is the freedom to become someone, not just anyone, not who your parents want you to be, not who your friends want you to be, not who Hollywood wants you to be, not even who you want to be. No, true freedom in Christ is freedom to become the man or woman that Christ desires you to be. And we see an image of this choice in today's gospel reading. This is the commission of the apostles. We see that when our Lord chose his apostles, we see that the apostles are given a choice, freedom. 
The Lord does not force them to go. He invites them. And they ultimately choose what to do with their lives. This is true freedom. They could have said, you know what? Christ, actually, I have plans today. And, you know, maybe maybe next week. Maybe I'll answer that call next week. Maybe, maybe a month from now. They didn't stop to think about all the things that they would lose or all the things that they would sacrifice by following Christ. They didn't think how this calling fits in their five-year plan or their 10-year plan. None of that. When we see the apostles and how they viewed Christ's call, they saw it as a reality they could not resist. It's very important that we must understand that Christ's call is in the same way addressed to each and every single one of us. So what does Christ our Savior expect from us? Well, above all, we are called upon to follow Christ and to imitate his love. So Christ calls the apostles. You can see their their willingness, their, their heart to sacrifice everything in order to follow Christ and to serve him. Their response is amazing. It's this readiness. It's this courage. It's to stand out even when society says that's weird. Christ wasn't calling them to a life of ease. No, he said, you are lambs among wolves. He didn't promise them physical safety. He didn't promise them comfort. No, he promised them self-denial, a life of service, dying to yourself, even at the cost of their earthly lives, so that they could enable others to attain eternal life. That's what he promised. He called them to put Christ and his church and the life of the gospel above everything. He was preparing them to take up the cross and spread the gospel, which is the good news, to a transformed life, a life with Christ. The Lord calls on each one of us in this gospel, whether it's in our homes, in our businesses, at the grocery store, at Target, at school, in the midst of challenges and hardships. He calls us to serve and to evangelize in his name. Wherever we go, you and I, we need to be conscious and striving to bring Christ with us. Right now, the youth have this thing going where they're taking that big plush Christ. I don't know if you've seen it around the church, but they're taking that large plush Christ and they're sharing it amongst themselves and they're taking it with them. So you might see this Instagram out there of our youth that are taking pictures with this Christ and having other people take Christ uh, pictures of Christ in different situations, Chipotle and all that kind of stuff. This, they're doing that literally, at, kind of as a, as a fun gesture. But we need to take Christ and be ready to, to stand up and to identify ourselves as Orthodox Christians, worshipers of the one true God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We need to keep the faith and share it because it is life for us and those who receive it. How do we do this? Authenticity speaks. Our witness speaks. But it costs us something. It costs our time. It costs us coming to worship even when we don't feel like it. Even when those errands are pressing. Inviting others to join for worship, loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, being willing to tell others about Christ and the Orthodox faith, even just identifying ourselves as as Orthodox Christians, making the sign of the cross before we start to eat, even in public places, let alone in our homes, fearing God more than we fear men. All of these actions help promote a culture of Christian faith in our secular society. They're subtle. Sometimes I think that the greatest challenge in the church today 
is not educational. It's not financial. I think the greatest challenge in our church today is not how to convince people to read more theology or to give more money. That's not it. The biggest challenge, I think, is for people to see themselves as they really are, as the holy church of God, called by Christ, separated from the world, living as pilgrims, living as exiles in this age, belonging to the age to come, the eternal kingdom. That's the biggest challenge that we have, for people to see that reality. If we can recover this biblical and patristic vision of who we are, then our educational readings, our theology, our finances, these things take care of themselves. We don't have to have big meetings for these things. As long as the people, as we, regard ourselves as outsiders, sometimes we will act accordingly. We will act like the world around us. It's only when we regard ourselves as called to holiness, as saints, called to belonging to God, and called to strive and to share His holiness as being in the world but not of the world, that the church will begin to regain its strength it will truly be alive. I have a privilege of wearing what I wear. It's a big sign saying, look at this Orthodox Christian. Some people don't understand that. So they say, what are you? What's happening over here? I have that privilege. I have that honor of wearing the cross very clearly. Not everybody has that. I think it's a disadvantage. The Lord is, is constantly telling people to follow him. He whispers in their hearts and he speaks through the words of the gospel. He is the great fisher of men. He seeks to ensnare our hearts and our minds so that we're not held captive by this world. Some people hear this call and they delay they delay the call. They think that once there's an ideal time or circumstance, then, then I'm going to allow myself to take the first step. Then I'll start to answer this call. Some hear this call and never even think of the possibility of answering this call. It's so foreign. They can't imagine their lives being disrupted this way. They have plans, they have focused plans. They can't imagine what blessings the Lord has in store for those who actually obey this call. Others reject the call completely because they don't want their lives to be branded a certain way or to be marked a certain way, belonging to Christ. They don't want to be labeled or seen that way. Some hear this call and respond immediately each one of us is being called. Each and every single one of us is being called. We're being called to serve in different capacities within the life of the church, but each one is being called to service. Not everyone is called to be a deacon. Not everyone is called to be a priest. Not everyone is called to make the holy bread. But every single one of us has been called to follow Christ more fully if we're not sure of our calling, we should fast, we should pray, we should consult with our fathers in confession. We should pray for the Lord saying, Lord, how can I follow you more? Lord, how can I unite my life with the life that you desire for me? How can I serve you more faithfully? The reality is none of us are worthy of the calling. I'm not. I'm not. The apostles were not worthy of the calling. It was obedience to the calling from God that made them worthy to know him intimately. 
It was obedience. Imagine the things that they saw and they experienced when they followed the Lord. Maybe another way to think of it. Imagine what they would have missed if they chose to refuse that call. But they had the freedom. They had that independence. What might we miss by ignoring the Lord's call? Again, another way to think of it. What might we gain by following the calling of Christ? Our Lord desires that each one of us follows him, but not by force. We follow primarily through our obedience to his teachings and the teachings of the church. He doesn't want to disrupt our lives in a negative way. But he offers us life. And this points to his extreme love. He loves us so much that he gives us freedom to choose our path. It's amazing. He asks us to choose our way. He gives us freedom and independence, and he gives us this choice. Will we choose the way of obedience or following our will? Or do we follow the path of life? Will we choose the way of personal freedom, which leads us to slavery in our sins? Or do we choose the path of slavery to Christ, knowing that this is in fact true freedom? This is the language of St. Paul, who calls himself a slave to God. We choose one of these ways each and every single day of our lives. There is no third way. Do you want to be a slave or to be a free human being? You cannot be both. Once we have tasted freedom, we never want to desire to go back to the bondage of slavery. We yoke ourselves to Christ. We become his servants, his slaves, by cutting off our will and living to serve to, and please the one who gave us life, who has redeemed our life. So to conclude, as to wrap these ideas up, as we reflect on this season of our civil calendar, this Independence Day, 4th of July, this kind of flags and fireworks and everything like that, I ask us to recall the amazing work that God has done on our behalf to grant us true independence. I pray that we can rededicate ourselves to love and to serve the one who has transformed us from lowly slaves to royalty. He made us heirs of the kingdom by his abundant love. The apostles, they were given no guarantees of their future. They left their work they didn't even know how their next meal would come. But they had great hope and faith. And we have the advantage. We know the power of the Messiah. If we cling to our own wants and to our own vision of what we should be, we are going to miss out. We are going to miss out on, on what God wants to make you. God, in his extreme love for us, has died, has risen again to offer us something, someone much more substantial than we could ever imagine. A chance to become a son and daughter of God by grace. Not simply to be called a son of God, but to be transformed through the work of the Holy Spirit and to truly become holy vessels. May we follow him boldly and allow him to transform our lives. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let